I made it to Stockholm, the Swedish capital. A city that is not just historic and modern and stunning beautiful, Stockholm also plays a big role when it comes to pop culture. The children's book author, Astrid Lindgren, for example, lived here when she wrote her famous stories. I already told you about that in my latest videos. But also, music history was written here. This building you see right behind me is the so-called Avicii Arena, a concert hall dedicated to the famous dance music producer who was born in Stockholm and also had his studio here. And well, Avicii was not the only one. When it comes to pop music, Sweden has an outstanding history. Sweden is the only country, alongside the United Kingdom and the United States of America, that exports more music than it imports. And a lot of songs we hear every day on the radio, sometimes without even knowing it, were written and produced by Swedes. Do you need a few examples? Well, the famous band ABBA, of course, is from Sweden. Also Roxette, Ace of Base, The Cardigans, Robin, Nini Cherry, The Swedish House Mafia, Dr. Alban, Licky Lee or Zara Larsson. This year Sweden also won the Eurovision Song Contest with its singer Loreen. The country has won the competition a total of seven times since the ESC was founded. So far only Ireland has achieved this. And well, last but not least, also Max Martin is from Sweden. You don't know who that is? Well, he basically wrote all the famous songs from the 90s. For example, all the big hits by Britney Spears, NSYNC or Bon Jovi or Brian Adams or Pink or Kelly Clarkson or currently, for example, also The Weeknd. I think it's time to dive a little deeper into this phenomenon. Why the heck is Sweden so damn good when it comes to pop music? Why are there so many successful musicians here? And what could other countries maybe learn from it? Let's find out. So, before we try to answer the question why Sweden is so good at pop music, I thought we should visit some places first that are important for this outstanding music history. Maybe that helps us to understand the musical spirit of this country a bit better. And the first place I want to show you is this boring building right behind me. There is absolutely nothing to see here. But behind those walls over here, some of the most famous pop music songs have been written, produced and recorded. It all started in the 1980s, when a Swedish producer group formed. The name was Swimix, five guys who started as an underground producer team and who distributed remixes of famous songs without permission, also known as bootlegs, to Swedish clubs and discotheques. The producer group became so successful in the Swedish club music scene that a nightclub owner basically sponsored them a studio with all sorts of equipment, which was, right, this inconspicuous building over here. One of those guys was a man called Sten Hallström, also known as Stonebridge. If you're a bit familiar with electronic dance music, you might know his name. And if not, you might know his remix of the song Show Me Love by Robin S, which was released in 1993 and was an absolute world success. One of the other guys of Swimix was a man called Dennis Pop. He produced the first songs of the Swedish band Ace of Bass, also the famous hit All That She Wants, and after this song totally blew up, the little music studio in Stockholm literally became the number one address for big artists all over the globe. Dennis Pop started a record label and production company called Chiron, and at the beginning of the 90s he also started to work with a musician and songwriter called 
Max Martin, I just told you about him. Their first successful collaboration was a song called Wish You Were Here by Rednecks, reaching number one in several European countries in 1994. And in the same year, they also released their song Look Who's Talkin' by Dr. Alban. But well, even though those two songs were already super successful, this was just the beginning. One year later, in 1995, an unknown boy band entered the doors of the small studio in Stockholm, five American guys who called themselves the Backstreet Boys. From that point on, the she -Run Studios with Max Martin and Dennis Pop basically produced all the big plastic pop songs we know from the 90s, Quit Playing Games With My Heart, for example, or Baby One More Time by Britney Spears, but also songs performed by Westlife, NSYNC and Brian Adams. The sad part of the story, Dennis Pop died in 1998, succumbing to cancer at the age of just 35. His colleague Max Martin, however, continued his work. The production studio here in Stockholm closed its doors in the 2000s, but Max Martin became the number one songwriter for basically every second pop song we know today. Here are a few examples of his work, Since You've Been Gone and Behind These Hazel Eyes by Kelly Clarkson, for example, It's My Life by Bon Jovi, It's Gonna Be Me by NSYNC, I Want It That Way by The Backstreet Boys, I Kissed a Girl by Katy Perry, so What by Pink, Shake It Off by Taylor Swift, yes yeah, Swifties, you heard me right, Love Me Like You Do by Ellie Goulding and Max Martin also wrote the famous hit song Blinding Lights by The Weeknd. What a career, right? Just a few kilometers away from the famous recording studio, in this huge building over here, we will find the Avicii Experience, a quite new exhibition that tells the story of Tim Berkling, the famous DJ, producer and songwriter who passed away in 2018. And his success story is also quite typical for many famous Swedish artists. Avicii's music career basically started in school. He used to go to the same class as Otto Nose and Alesso, who later also became very big names in the electronic music scene. As teenagers, they started to work together on songs. And just like the Swimix guys, also Avicii started to spread his songs and remixes in young years in the dance music scene. But well, not in clubs and on records like in the 1990s, he did it on the internet and also got his first record deal because of that. Avicii's first commercial hit was a song called Seek Bromance under his artist name Tim Berg. His breakthrough, however, was of course the song Levels, released in 2011, which became number one in 10 countries. The rest of the story is known. Avicii became one of the most successful music producers in recent years. His country dance pop song Wake Me Up, for example, reached number one on the hit lists in 20 countries. He was nominated or won prizes for the Grammy Awards, the American Music Awards or the MTV Video Music Awards. He worked with stars like Ello Black or Rita Ora and also the song A Sky Full of Stars by Coldplay was produced by Avicii. The downside of this success, Avicii always struggled with fame. In a 2018 Netflix documentary, it becomes pretty clear that he's actually a very introverted guy who's not really made for standing in front of large crowds and already in early years he began to numb his stage fright with alcohol before his performances. This later caused several health problems and also drug abuse was later a big part of Avicii's life as a music star. On April 20, 2018, Avicii was found dead during a vacation in Oman. One and a half years later, Avicii's family announced that the cause of death was suicide. He was only 28 years old when he died. The Avicii experience in Stockholm, which was opened in 2022, tells the story of this outstanding but also tragic career. It tells the story of Avicii's youth and how he produced his first songs in the bedroom, his legendary rise but also his fall, and it tells the story of his legacy and what he actually left to the music scene. 
Admission is 19 euros. Well, and if we talk about famous Swedish artists, we of course also need to talk about the most successful band ever, ABBA. And their story is told over here in the ABBA Museum. The journey of ABBA began in the early 1970s, when Björn and Benny, two aspiring Swedish musicians, met and began writing songs together. They soon joined forces with the vocalist Agneta and Annie Frid, Their band name, ABBA, is an acronym formed from the letters of each member's name. In the early days, ABBA actually struggled to find success. They recorded several demos and performed at local clubs, but they were unable to secure a record deal. All of that, however, changed in 1972, when they won the Swedish Melody Festival with the song Ring Ring. The song became a Swedish hit and it helped to attract the attention of record labels. ABBA signed with Polar Music, a Swedish record label, and they began releasing hit singles such as Honey Honey and Dancing Queen. And in 1974, they also won the Eurovision Song Contest with the song Waterloo, and this victory catapulted them to international stardom. The group, during its career, sold over 400 million records worldwide. In the ABBA Museum in Stockholm, you'll be transported back to the 1970s, the era of ABBA's greatest success. You see the band's iconic costumes, instruments and awards. Well, you can even step into a recording studio and create your own ABBA song. Admission is 20 euros. So, there is one last thing I'd like to mention, because Sweden not only has quite successful music artists, it also plays a big role when it comes to music infrastructure. The building you see right behind me is the headquarter of Spotify, one of the most successful music streaming services ever, and it was founded right here in Stockholm. In the early 2000s, the music industry was facing a big crisis. Piracy was rampant and record sales were plummeting. And in this challenging environment, two Swedish entrepreneurs, Daniel Ek and Martin Lorenzson, had a vision. In 2006, they launched Spotify, a music streaming service that offered users access to a vast library of songs for a monthly subscription fee. The idea was simple give people a legal and affordable way to listen to all the music they wanted and they would be less likely to turn to piracy. The funny thing about this is, at that time, Sweden did not only invent the legal music streaming service, Sweden also played a very big role in music piracy. The website The Pirate Bay was founded in 2003 in Sweden. So when it comes to shaking up the music scene, the Swedes were always a little ahead of their time. Spotify's early years were not without challenges. The music industry was initially resistant to the new service and many labels were reluctant to license their music. However, Egg and Lorenzon were persistent and they eventually managed to secure deals with the major labels. As Spotify's user base grew, so did its popularity. By 2010, Spotify had over 10 million active users. Well, and today, the world's leading music streaming service is not a product from the Silicon Valley. Nope, it's Spotify from Stockholm in the small country of Sweden with over 456 million monthly active users. The service is available in over 180 countries and it offers access to over 80 million songs. And what becomes a hit today is no longer just determined by record companies and marketing. Rather, it is Spotify's playlists and algorithm that decide who becomes a star and 
who doesn't? Of course, there is also a lot of criticism of this model. Spotify pays artists an amount of around 0.003 euros per stream. So if you want to make money with your music on streaming services, you really have to land a hit and get millions and millions of streams. Then of course it's worth it. But the streaming business is not very lucrative, especially for smaller artists. They have been fighting for a fairer pay for many years. Okay, now we've learned a lot about Swedish music history. Now it's time to answer the most important question. Why? Why do all the great hits and songwriters and artists and streaming services come from this country? And why is Sweden obviously so much better than other countries when it comes to pop music? Well, if you do your research on this topic, you will come across all sorts of explanations. There are music discussion boards on the internet discussing this topic for years now. Music magazines also reported on this. And also the science already studied this topic. Well, and there are a few explanations that you read in all those publications over and over again. Theory number one, early music education. In Sweden, people come into contact with music already at a young age. And, well, not by accident, this has actually something to do with politics. There are numerous publicly subsidized music programs in schools in Sweden, and around 30% of Swedish children take part in them. This also applies to the previously mentioned hit writer Max Martin. In interviews he repeatedly stated that his early music education was a cornerstone of his later success. Also adults in Sweden are encouraged through special music programs. The Swedish Arts Council supports around 100 music acts with 1.5 million euros every year. Sums in the high millions also flow to concert halls and regional music groups. And well, maybe this is already one of those things that other countries can learn from Sweden. A study by the University of Münster in Germany says that three times as many children and young people attend a music school in Sweden as in my home country, Germany, for example. The course fees and the loan of instruments in the country are also cheaper. So, the early music education obviously plays a pretty big role. But, well, there is more. Theory number two. The Swedes just love music. Pop music is not only a thing that you hear on the radio in Sweden. No, it's an important part of the Swedish culture and you can also hear and see that in the media. Music shows play a very big role on Swedish television. For example, there is All Song på Skansen, a sing-along event that has existed since 1935 and is broadcast every year by Swedish television. The music show Så mycket bättre is also extremely successful and there are also many music quiz shows on Swedish TV. The musical highlight every year is the so-called Melody Festivalen, Melody Festival, a six-week Saturday evening competition in which the participant is chosen for the Eurovision Song Contest. If you compare this to other European countries, this is not just a lame TV show. Around 4 million people tune in every year. That's almost half of the population. So, we have a lot of Swedes who make music and a lot of Swedes that love music. And then there is another important factor that plays a pretty big role when it comes to music export. Theory number three. Sweden is international. The Swedish music industry is very focused on the world market and not only on the local market here in Sweden. Why is not entirely clear, but an explanation could be that it's just more lucrative. With just 10 million inhabitants, the country is one of the smaller countries in Europe. If you produce music in France or Germany, for example, you don't really need an international market. There are enough people who could buy or stream your music. It's not exactly like that in Sweden. 
Of course, there is a regional music scene here. If you take a look at the country's Spotify charts, you will find a lot of Swedish language hits here. But it's also clear it's more worth it to produce for the international market. The logical consequence in Sweden, either songs are written directly for the rest of the world or Swedish hits are later rewritten into English. This happened a lot, for example, in 2006. The dance song Boten Anna by Bass Hunter, you may remember it, it was released in Swedish first and later re released as an English language version called Now You're Gone, that finally became a global success. Other artists, such as the former ESC participant Benjamin Ingrosso, sometimes publish songs in Swedish and sometimes in English. The music scene in Sweden is also closely networked and aims to make Swedish music music internationally known. A non-profit organization called Export Music Sweden, for example, promotes Swedish artists abroad. But well, just producing music for the world, of course, is not enough. It also has to be successful. And it seems like the Swedes have an unusual talent for that, maybe also because of their language skills. Theory number four. The Swedes speak and sing very good English. Various surveys, including one by the European Union and the English Proficiency Index, give Sweden the highest level of English proficiency among European countries where English is not a native language. Unlike other European countries, Swedes also do not dub English language TV shows and films, so also children come in contact with the English language already in early years. And of course, if you have a feeling for the English language, it also helps you to write good English songs. Anyway, English is still not the mother language of Swedish people. It's also not my mother language as a German. You can hear that when I speak. I sound different, I make grammatical errors, I phrase sentences differently than a native English speaker might do it. And well, you can actually also hear this phenomenon in big Swedish hits. The lyrics of the song I Want It That Way by the Backstreet Boys, written by Max Martin, for example, make absolutely no sense at all. <laughs> the story that is told about this pop song is that Max Martin was not a very good English speaker back in the day, so he just wrote the song and they changed the lyrics of the song later so they made more sense. But the Backstreet Boys just didn't like them, so they left the song as it was. Ulf Ekberg, who is a founding member of the band Ace of Base, explains this phenomenon to the newspaper The National like this. For Sweden, melody is number one and always has been. While the Americans, it's the lyrics first, production second and melody last. I'm not saying the lyrics are not important, but for us Swedes, for whom English is our second language, we just try to make it understood by a world audience. Because of this focus on lyrics, some of the American songs are complicated and can sometimes be not much fun. While for us, we always try to reach as many people as we can, so we have few good melodies and simple lyrics so everyone can have fun. Well, sounds like a good formula for success. Right? <laughs> and well, if we talk about melodies, there is another and one last theory that you read over and over again, not at least from Swedes themselves. Theory number five. Swedish songs are so melancholic. The country's official PR website, Sweden SE, states that Swedish songs always have a certain melancholy that songs by foreign artists often do not have. This is supposed to be triggered by the long dark winters in the country, which obviously offer a very special atmosphere to write good melancholic pop songs. The melancholy is a tradition began by ABBA, who took the cue from Swedish folk music, the website writes, tunes once whistled in the depth of the pine forest now echo worldwide. This theory could actually be true. Loreen's ESC hit, Tattoo, is danceable, but it also consists of a striking number of minor chores. In addition, kitschy romantic language images like violence playing and the angels crying, stuff like that. 
Also, the music that started this Swedish pop phenomenon has a high number of minor choids in it. Look at this song by Ace of Bass, for example. Or even look at Look Who's Talking by Dr. Alban. It starts with a minor chord, it continues with a minor chord, and that's very typical for all the big Swedish hits. They are fun, they are catchy, they are danceable, but also a bit sad and melancholic at the same time. So, it seems like in Sweden we have a quite special mix of different factors. We have a good connected music scene, we have early music education, we have a quite interesting internationality that other countries might not have in this form, and of course we have a country that just loves music. And well, in the end there is just one more thing I can say, like ABBA did back in the day, Thank you, Sweden. Thank you for the music. There is one more thing I'd like to mention before we end today's video. You might have noticed, I talked a lot about music today, but I actually didn't play any of the songs I mentioned. And that's because it's still a super complicated and frustrating thing to license commercial music for a YouTube video. I tried it, I bought licenses for a lot of money and I still receive copyright claims all the time. So in the end, I just gave up and I produced the video without the music. Anyway, if you want to listen to all those songs I talked about today, I made a Spotify playlist for you and you will find it down in the description below. So, here we are again, back in the hotel. That was my trip to Stockholm. And that was also my story about Sweden's outstanding music history. If you liked this video and if you have learned something, then please leave a thumbs up. You can also hit the subscribe button and ring the bell so you won't miss any upcoming video. And if you like to support me and my work, you can also do that, for example, on Patreon. The link is in the description down below. And you can also become a channel member on my YouTube channel. Then you will get exclusive stuff and new videos before everyone else. So you should check that out. But that's it for today. Have a safe journey and um, see you next time. <laughs>